Hi everybody. My name is Ben, and I work on the Swift Standard Library team at Apple, and I'm here to talk to you today about the Swift Standard Library, what its goals are, how you can extend it, and potentially about contributing those extensions back to the Swift project. So what is the standard library? Well, one way you can think about any library is as a vocabulary. And a language's standard library is the basic vocabulary for communicating in that language. That vocabulary sits beneath other libraries. So in Swift's case, the standard library supports foundation, which provides higher level operations, like interacting with URLs or providing localization. Now in Swift, that library is designed to be easy to expand, helping Swift to become a more expressive language. Let's look at some examples of how that expressivity really matters. So what does this code do? It's not a trick question. It's a simple piece of code, but how do you know what it does? Well, you've already seen it once today. But to know what it does, you have to run it in your head like an interpreter would in order to know that what it's doing is transforming an array of numbers into a new array of strings. Even for a simple loop like that, that's a lot of processing that your brain has to do in order to know what it does. So you can't be certain that it's doing what you think it is. Now, in the case of the for loop, everybody agrees that something like this, instead of index iteration, is better. It's so accepted these days that pretty much every language has added some kind of for in syntax for iterating over arrays. But why is it better? Well, it removes boilerplate and replaces it with something really readable. You don't need to worry about index iteration, using the subscript operation, or anything like that. It's more clear, and that means you can be more certain when you write it that it does what you meant. Now, the standard library is about adding much more of this, of adding that common vocabulary of basic operations that help you clearly express your code in a way that's readable and avoids correctness issues and also has performance benefits. So for example, in this code, there's still a lot of boilerplate going on there obscuring what you probably want to spend all of your time focused on, which is the really important part, the part of how you're transforming the individual elements. But also, when you're writing code like this, it's easy to miss out on performance improvements. Like Paul mentioned earlier, the version of map has been tweaked. So you can reserve the right amount of space in the array up front. And that means that you don't have expensive reallocations when you're appending elements to the array and it needs to get bigger. It's easy to forget to do performance improvements like this, and even if you do remember them, they're getting in the way, cluttering up your code and obscuring it. Which is why pretty much every language these days has added a map to their standard library. Once you know that that verb map has been added to the basic vocabulary of Swift, it helps make your code more readable. Now, it's hard to mess up a loop like map, though I'm sure you could manage it if you tried hard enough. But there are plenty of common operations that are easy to get wrong. For example, let's say you want to walk backwards through an array. You have to get your while loop conditioned just right. And if you put your decrement in the wrong place, then you get an out of bounds error. Whereas if you know about the reversed property on collections, you can get back your nicer for in statement, and you can be certain that it's doing exactly what you meant. Or supposing you wanted to skip over the first element when you're iterating over an array. You can't do that with a simple for in loop, so you might fall back to using indices and subscripts. But there's an edge condition here. If your array is ever empty, then you'll get an out-of-bounds error. Whereas if you use the drop first method available on collection, you can avoid that nasty error condition, because dropping the first element of an empty collection is a no-op, and you get back your nicer for in syntax. And of course, indexes aren't completely redundant. There's plenty of algorithms where you really do need them. But even then, there's ways to make this clearer. That range of zero up to array.count is a really roundabout way of saying what you really mean, which is that you want to iterate over the indices of a collection, which is why every collection has an indices property that lets you do exactly that, and you're writing what you mean rather than expressing it via components. And because indices are themselves collections, they support things like reversing or slicing like we saw earlier. So the standard library is about performing these common tasks. And if you ever find yourself performing a really basic common thing, it's worth taking a minute out 
to check whether it doesn't already exist in the standard library, that you don't want to go on and reinvent it yourself. If at first you can't find it, a really great way of checking that you're not missing something is on the new user forums that have recently replaced mailing lists on swift.org. Here's an example from a few days ago where somebody's asking about what turned out to be the version of map and flat map on optional that you heard about earlier. Asking questions like this on the user forums is also really useful for those of us who work on the standard library because it gives us a signal of the kind of operations that people want to achieve and aren't finding an answer to quickly. But you might find that after you've checked, this kind of operation doesn't already exist. But that's fine because Swift makes it really easy to extend the standard library types with helper methods that you write yourself. There's really no difference between the versions of uh, methods that exist in the standard library and the ones that you write on these. And that leads to the next question, which is, supposing you had a really useful general utility like this, maybe it belongs in the standard library. Maybe we should add it. So Swift had uh, its open source birthday a little over two years ago recently, and here's the birthday cake that we had for it with an upside down Swift logo on it. And with Swift going open source came the evolution process. Anybody with a good idea for an enhancement to the language can write up a proposal and an implementation, pitch it to the community, and get it accepted. And now with the new user forums, we actually have a de dedicated area for pitching your new ideas to the community to see if there's traction and whether you're not the only one who would want an, an interesting proposal like this to become part of the Swift common vocabulary. So supposing you do have an idea like that and you think, hey, this would really make a good addition to the standard library. How do you know if it would be accepted? So a while ago, I wrote a list of criteria that I thought people could use as a way to judge whether or not something belongs in the standard library. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through this list then we're going to look at a proposal that's currently running on Swift Evolution that you can comment on to see if it matches up to these criteria. So first of all, is it a common problem? Remember, the standard library is Swift's basic vocabulary. We want to avoid the API being really bloated because a really huge API is hard to use. Does it make code more readable? As with the examples we saw before and also the ones you saw in Paul's presentation, if something reads like a natural way of saying exactly what it is the code is doing, that's a good sign. Is it flexible enough? We want to avoid adding very narrow use cases. Instead, we prefer to expand them out to make them general to solve multiple different varied use cases. Does it help write correct code? Does it help people avoid edge cases like the drop first example we saw? And can it avoid common performance problems that people not, might not be aware they're making? Now, you don't have to fulfill all of these criteria. So, for example, you might have uh, an idea for a less common thing, but people do need to do it from time to time, and when they do try and implement it, it's notoriously difficult to get right, and that would still make for a good addition. So let's use these criteria to assess a proposal that's running right now, and that's to add an in-place remove where to the standard library's collection interfaces. Does it help with readability? Does it help people with correctness and performance? And is it flexible enough? It's a bit more subjective whether this is a common operation. Uh, I'm a bit biased because this is my own proposal, but hopefully you're with me that uh, this is a thing that people commonly want to be able to do. So the feature is pretty simple. Given a predicate that tests an element, an immutable collection, remove all of the entries that match the predicate from the collection in place. Here's an attempt to do it that iterates over the indices, checking the elements, and then removing them if they match. If you try and do it this way, you'll immediately hit a problem because the array is shrinking as you iterate over it. And so if you iterate over all of the original indices, you'll fall off the end and get an out of bounds error. So clearly, there's a problem with people getting this code correct that we need to help with. So you might try and rewrite that using a while loop, and it gets a bit messy. You have to manually track the index yourself. There's a really nasty edge case where if two adjacent elements need removing, you need to make sure not to hop over them as they slide down underneath. So clearly, this is a bit unreadable, and there's a justification there. Now, if you know a trick, you can go backwards through the indices, and that avoids the nasty edge cases and the case of falling off the end. But there's still a more fundamental problem with this algorithm, 
and that has to do with performance. Now, every method in the standard library has a complexity guarantee. That's a guarantee of the worst case execution time. In the case of remove at, that complexity is order n. That means as the size of the array grows, the time taken in the worst case to remove an element increases in proportion to the size of the array. So why is that? Well, arrays are backed by a contiguous blob of memory. So when you remove an element, all of the elements after them have to shuffle down to fill that gap. So in the case of our while loop, we remove an element, and all of the elements have to shuffle down. We remove, remo we remove another one, and they have to shuffle down, and so on until you get to the end. So the complexity of this loop is quadratic. That is, if the size of the array is n, the worst case execution time is going to be bounded by n squared. And if you ever want to reinforce how slow quadratic algorithms can be, just try animating one in Keynote. <laughs> now, for small arrays, this isn't a big deal. And so for some cases in your app, it might not be a problem. You could just write this loop and move on, even though we've seen that writing the loop is not the easiest thing. But for very large arrays, it could be a major problem. If you've ever used an application that got way slower when you added a lot of entries to a list, it could easily have been because of something like this. So clearly, there's a case for helping people with the performance of this operation as well. Luckily, there's already a good way to do this with existing components in the standard library. You can just use filter. Filter takes a closure of elements to keep. So we can just use that to create a new array of the elements we want, and then write that back over the top of the original array. If you had a one-off need to do this, this would be a really good way to do it. It solves the performance problem. Or rather, it, it solves it partly for large arrays. There's still a problem with it, which we're going to come back to in a second. Nonetheless, you could wrap this for reuse inside an extension on array. And then that makes the expression of what you're trying to do a lot clearer. So now we have something that might make a good candidate. But remember, we want to keep methods in the standard library flexible. This is flexible in one sense because it takes a closure, and that's a really good way of covering a lot of different use cases for how you might decide to remove an element. But it's only specific to array. We want to make it available on lots more types than that. So what we want to do is we want to extend a protocol. So every collection in the standard library conforms to the collection protocol. There's just four basic methods you need to implement to be a collection. And from that, you get all sorts of things like indices and count and drop first for free. But we want to mutate the collection. We want to change it. And that means we need another protocol. Range replaceable protocol refines collection and provides methods for changing protocols, like an empty init that allows you to create a new instance of the collection, and append that allows you to add elements onto the end. From these two operations, you can build filter, because that's basically just creating a new collection and then adding the chosen elements onto the end of it. So there's a default implementation of filter for every range replaceable collection. Array is a range replaceable collection, so we can rewrite our extension on array to be an extension on range replaceable collection instead. Because we built it from filter, which was itself a generic method, nothing else needs changing about this to make it generic. So now we can use it on other different types in the standard library or any user-defined type that's range replaceable. So you can use it to remove characters from a string, for example. So now we have a really good candidate for adding to the standard library. It helps people avoid accidentally quadratic, quadratic loops and having to write really gnarly for loops. But we can still do a little bit better on performance. And why is that? Our implementation used filter, which created a new array and then copied it back over the top. That ran in linear time, but it still allocates memory. That can be relatively expensive. In fact, you probably find that for smaller arrays, the cost of allocating the memory is pretty greater than the cost of the quadratic loop we wrote the first time around. We really want to do this in place, because we want to reuse the memory that the collection already has. Luckily, there is a way to do this in place in linear time. You find the first element you want to remove. Then you find the one next to it. And if it's one you want to keep, you move it down over the top of the element you don't want and move on. If you find an element that you want to remove, you just skip over it. Skip over once you want to remove, move down once you want to keep, keep doing this till you get to the end of the array, and eventually you'll have some junk at the end that you just need to trim off. So what does this look like in code? 
So let's start by extending array. Now, I find it's always best to start by extending a concrete type, even if you know you want to generalize it later. So first, we find the first element we want to remove. We use the index where to find it. If there's nothing to remove, then we're done, and we just return. This is already a big performance win over the filter version, where if there was nothing to remove, we ended up copying every single element, which can be especially expensive if there's lots of reference counting involved in destroying and creating elements. Then we loop over the entire of the collection, checking each element, and if it matches, we move it down. Then when we're done, we trim off the junk at the end. So this is an implementation on array. How do we turn it into an implementation on a protocol? So previously, we were only using one method, filter, and we could get that from one protocol, range replaceable. For this implementation, we're, we're using two methods, but we need to take them from two different protocols. Range replaceable collection, which makes remove subrange available, and mutable collection, which allows us to replace individual elements in constant time in the collection, which is something we rely on for our, our linear time algorithm. So why are there two different collections? Well, Array has both of these capabilities, but not all different kinds of collections might be able to do both things. For example, unsafe mutable buffer is a view over some raw memory that you can put on and make it behave like a collection. You can swap elements around in it in constant time, but you can't resize it because it's on top of some raw memory that you have to manually manage. On the other hand, string is the opposite. So strings can grow and shrink. But because Unicode characters are variable width, you can't replace, for example, the family emoji with a single letter because all of the elements of the, shorter, of the short, now shorter character would have to shuffle down, which, as we've seen, can't happen in constant time. But Array does support both of these things, so we can change our extension on Array to be an extension on the two protocols together. Because we've implemented our algorithm from other generic components, just like we did with Filter, very little needs changing in order to make this generic. The one tweak we did have to make is that we use index after instead of adding one to the index, because not all collections use an integer as their index type. So now we have a generic method that's flexible, as well as being performant, readable, and correct. Notice that we didn't add a new protocol as part of this. It's actually pretty rare that you need to add a protocol as part of a proposal to extend the standard library. The real power of adding new features is when you extend existing protocols that multiple different types already conform to, including potentially user-defined types that get all of these new capabilities for free. Now, I fully admit that this last part of the implementation is a bit like the internet joke about the tutorial for drawing an owl, you know, where step one is draw a couple of circles, and then step two is draw the rest of the owl. But you don't have to have a perfect implementation to get all the way through a proposal or even to get your enhancement released as part of the standard library. There's always improvements to be made. Just last week, somebody pointed out to me a big performance improvement that I'd completely missed in the implementation I just showed you. And there's actually more tweaks that we could make and custom implementations we could make for concrete types. Once you have an implementation that you feel pretty good about, and it's got a good reception on your pitch on Swift Evolution, there's now a dedicated section of the Swift developer forums where you can get advice on how to work on the standard library, including making these kind of performance improvements as well as making your code fit with the overall style of the standard library. If you're enthusiastic about Swift and want to learn more and stretch your Swift skills, and I'm guessing if you're watching this talk that you do, then you can play a part in improving and extending the Swift language. And if you need some help with inspiration because you want to get involved but you're not sure on an idea for a proposal, then head over to bugs.swift.org where you'll find multiple different bugs tagged with the starter proposal keyword that you can use for inspiration. Writing generic code in Swift can be a lot of fun, and together we can help make Swift a better language. Thanks.